Today, our subject is Jews of Libya. And um, if I can, I would like to show you the book. So this book came out in 2018. Um, it's a collection of essays. And it came out in Italian last July, 2020. Um, collection of essays and photographs edited by my late husband, Jacques Roumani, Zifan Le Baha, who grew up in Benghazi. And uh, I was a co-editor and David uh, Magnaggi, another co-editor and Vivian Roumani Den, one of our contributors. Um, so uh, I do recommend it to everybody. And uh, now I'll go on and introduce our two speakers in order of speaking. Um, Vivian Romani Den, her title is Libyan Jews in the Italian Fascist Internment Camp of Jaddo. So we're beginning in the 1940s and we'll proceed chronologically from there. Um, Vivian is an oral historian, a writer, and documentary film director. She served as Judaica librarian at the University of California, Berkeley, where she created the website jewsoflibia.com in 1998. Uh, and how many of us were creating websites in 1998? I know I certainly mm -hmm. wasn't. And she was the executive director of the American Sephardi Federation. Her oral histories of Jews from Libya are in collections of the Library of Congress and the National Library of Israel. Vivian's documentaries, The Last Jews of Libya, 2007, narrated by Isabella Rossellini, and Out of Print, 2013, narrated by Meryl Streep, both premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and have been viewed worldwide. Um, our second speaker takes us to the post-war period. Uh, Daniela willard Kyle will speak on Not Within the Mandate, Libyan Jewish Refugees in Italian Displaced Persons Camps. Um, Danielle completed her PhD in Modern European History at Rutgers University in 2020. She earned an MST in Jewish Studies from the University of Oxford, an MA in History and Jewish Studies from the University of Toronto, and a BA in History from Westmont College before going to Rutgers. Her dissertation, Living in Liminal Spaces, Jewish Refugees in Italian Displaced Persons Camps, 1945 to 1951, recovered the stories of long silenced European and North African Jewish displaced persons, DPs, after World War II. She's interested in the intersection of post-war Jewish refugees in, it, in Italy and in the ways this research can connect to current events in immigration. She has given presentations on her research at multiple academic conferences and received numerous grants and fellowships, including the Association for Jewish Studies Dissertation Fellowship, uh, the Steven Spielberg Endowment for Jewish Studies uh, Doctoral Fellowship at Rutgers, the 2019 Graduate Research Fellowship at the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research, 2018 JDC Archives Regional Fellowship, and 2017 Visiting Fellowship at the United States Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. And uh, so I will uh, give the floor or the screen to the participants and hope you enjoy this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, David and Ton, for having us, and Judy for organizing it, and all the wonderful participants, some of whom it looks like I know personally. Hello. And um, um, it's just a pleasure to be here. Thank you. OK. Libya, which was part of the Ottoman Empire until 1911, is in North Africa, across the Mediterranean from Italy. Uh, there have long been commercial ties between Libya and Italy, 
And in 1911, Italy invaded Libya and wrestled control from the Ottomans. Although Libyan Arabs resisted Italian rule for another 20 years. Prior to the uh, start of World War II, there were about 33,000 Jews in Libya. 4,500 were in the eastern region of Cyrenaica, um, mostly in Benghazi, where I was born, right there. Um, and these are the ones on whom we focus today. The remainder were in Tripolitania in the west, mostly in Tripoli, and, but also in mountain communities in the south of Tripoli and the area of Misrata. A bit of historical background about the war in North Africa. Italy and Germany signed a treaty of friendship in 1936. Mussolini signed a military pact with Hitler in May 1939. Italy instituted comprehensive anti-Jewish racial laws in 1938. These were implemented gradually in Libya, but were fully in place by 1941. Italy declared war on Great Britain um, um, and invaded Libya in 1939. Egypt, where British forces were based. Egypt is right there. On September 13, 1940, the Italians, the Italian forces were driven back on December 9, and the British, from here, occupied Benghazi. The Jews welcomed the British, whose forces included Jewish soldiers from Palestine. They viewed the British as liberators after having experienced the racial laws. Ramos' German African Corps arrived in Libya in March 1941, and British forces withdrew from the Benghazi again boom, uh, at the beginning of April. Italian residents of Benghazi, who viewed the Jews as collaborators joined by some Arabs, rioted and destroyed Jewish property on April 3rd, killing two Jews. British forces again occup occupied Cyrenaica in late December 1941, but this time the Jews were more circumspect in their interactions with the British, who withdrew again on January 29. Many Libyan Jews who held British passports left with the British. Starting in January 1942, Libyan Jews holding British passports together with other British citizens were sent to internment camps in Italy. Some ultimately ended up in camps in Germany and in Austria after the fall of Mussolini. Yossi Sukari's no novel, Benghazi to Bergen-Belsen, is a fictionalized description of his mother's experience. On February 7, 1942, Mussolini ordered the removal of all Jews from Cyrenaica, a process that took place between May and late October. Those holding French or Tunisian nationalities were transported by truck to Tunisia, right there, or Algeria. My own family arrived in Tunisia in September. Between May and October, about 2,500 Jews with Libyan nationality, together with about 50 Italian Jews, were sent in trucks to a former military camp in Jado, a village in the mountain 200 kilometers southwest of Tripoli, and a five-day trip from Benghazi. Another 400 were sent to villages in the mountains of Tripolitania. A small number of Jews were permitted to remain in Benghazi and elsewhere in Cyrenaica to look after community property. This is a model of the Camp Jado. We do not have uh, real pictures as far as I'm concerned. Our focus today is on the camp in Jado. In 1998, I conducted oral histories of Jews from Libya, mostly living in Israel. There had been, uh, three had been interned in Jado, and most of what I have to say is in their words. This, this Chaim. The Italians took all the Jews of Benghazi to Jado. It was a concentration camp surrounded with barbed wire. There was a Maresciallo Capo, a chief marshal. There was a big dormitory. It was an open dormitory. There was a space given to each family divided by curtains. I remember very well, Jora. There was dirt, flies. There were like army barracks. 
in each barrack, there were about 40 families together. Just blanket separated each family. Moshe, every family took a three by four meter, meter area inside and hung blankets, no beds. We slept on chsera. These are um, straw-like mats, uh, like sardines. We had no blankets for sleeping because we used them for walls. The guards were Italians and Arab. They guarded us from outside the electric fence. One of them was a major with boots and a whip for horses. He would go into the camp, into the barracks. Sanitary conditions were extremely poor and water was available only a few hours a day. Moshe, we got the Tifo Pidocchioso, house, uh, Laos typhus. 700 to 900 died from it. And we had lice, they would cover us. They were white. When the British came, they took the blankets because the lice lived in them. I remember it well. I was 13. I had my bar mitzvah there. Chaim. Then came the disease called Tifo Pidocchioso. I remember very well. Seven, eight, ten people died daily. My uncle Benjamin was 24, married. The third month he died from appendicitis. Jora. I came there pregnant. My daughter was born there and then she died there. Other sources indicate that the number who died from typhus was probably 550 to 600, which is still a large percentage of the community, nearly one fourth food was limited. Moshe, there was hunger. We had no food. We got a piece of bread like a small roll, round, made with sbul, which is maiz, corn. Uh, everyone ate half. We were six and we got three rolls. My mom gave hers to my brother. The younger ones got. I didn't eat because I would make two. Jora, some died from hunger and disease. When we tried to eat a piece of bread, we had to fight through the bugs. Chaim, they gave 50 grams of bread per day, black bread. Now other reports suggest that the bread allocation was 100 to 150 grams a day and a weekly distribution of some rice or pasta, tomato sauce, oil, sugar, tea or coffee. But there's no doubt that the food ration was meager. So how did they get additional food? They brought money and jewelry with them and time. There was an Arab market. They would come to Jad on Thursdays and Fridays, twice a week, and the Jews would sell their things to get some food. Other reports indicate that some food and money was also sent from the community in Tripoli. Daily activity was cleaning the camp, including emptying latrines. Some were put to work tearing the barracks to prepare for the cold winter labor. Moshe. All we did was clean the camp. We had no strength. People were not moving except the young ones. There was no school or anything. We did nothing all day. We all believed we had emunah, faith. We would say the tehillim, the psalms, and pray. All three remembered one traumatic event in which the prisoners were gathered together and threatened with death. This may have happened near the time of liberation. A story apparently circulated that they were saved by the intervention of the King of Italy. Chaim, one day I remember that day very well. I was 14 or 15. They grouped all the males together and said they had to come to the middle of the camp. My mom hid me and all the Jews, all the women, the children, the women were crying. After a few hours, I got out from my hiding place. As a child, I wanted to see. So I went to see, and I see all the police, the captain, both Arabs and Italians. I saw them and I ran away. I fell and I hurt myself very much. There wasn't a hospital to cure my wound. My mom gave me tea, coffee, but that was it. And it became infected. After that, we went to the doctor and he said in a few weeks, we have to amputate the leg. 
Moshe, one day they brought all the camp to the square and they had machine guns there, like in the movies, in a truck. There were four of them. I was young, 12 years old. I didn't know what it was, but there was an order from the king not to kill us. Punish them, don't give them food and they will die. Jora, one day they came to take us to this big place, all of us. They put us in a circle and they brought that thing like a machine gun that they put in the middle of to kill us all. They crowded us together. They were going to kill us. They prepared us for slaughter. After min 15 minutes, a call from the king of Italy. He said, make them suffer, but don't kill them. The commandant released us and took the elders, the rabbis, the hachamim, and told them to sweep the floor with their beards. And that's what they did on their stomach on the floor. This sculpture compliments of my late brother, Jacques and Judy, um, is in front of the Holocaust Museum in Vienna. You see that this was a standard procedure, I guess. British troops began a successful offensive in November, 1942, and they swept across the Libyan desert, conquering Tripoli on January 23rd. Benedetto describes a difficult trip through the desert on roads washed out by rain and a bridge destroyed by retreating Italians in order to bring food and drink to the camp. The camp. Benedetto, when Alfonso Barda came, he said, Benedetto, we need to go to bring food to Giado. They had just liberated the concentration camp and the English had not yet arrived. I arrived there when the Italian police were still in charge of Giado. The people from Benghazi who knew me came to greet me. Then an Italian police marshal came, gave me a slap. He made me drop. No, no, he did not steal any food. The British found the occupants to be in very poor health. Moshe, the British did not let us leave the camp. They kept us and cleaned us and our clothes. They made us naked, the English. The doctors had masks. We had the illness and they were afraid it was contagious. The joint, that is the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, sent food in cars with Magen Davids. We ate and got stronger and went back to Benghazi. The British began evacu evacuating the camp residents in May of 1943 and the last ones returned to Benghazi in October. Benedetto again, they told me you must bring back a group of people, Jews, from Jado to Benghazi. It took us three or four days on the road and we returned with English military who then occupied Tunisia. We were four Jewish drivers and there were two Catholics and one Arab. Benghazi was bombed relentlessly during the war because of its strategic location for supplies for both sides. For the Axis troops when they were advancing eastward and for the British when they were advancing westward. They thus returned to a city that had been devastated by war. Here's how my mother described the city when she returned from Tunisia in September 1944. Mama, we did not recognize the country, raised to the ground. Few houses remain. One couldn't recognize it. The Jews of Tripolitania were not sent to concentration camps, but in September 1942, some 3,000 men were sent to a labor camp near Homs, 125 east, uh, kilometers east um, of Tripoli to do road work. It's right there. More than half were sent back, and those who remained were treated reasonably well because the project was headed by a Libyan Jewish engineer. 350 were sent to Bukbuk in Western Egypt uh, um, to build roads, but this camp was abandoned in October in the face of the British advance, and the Jews had to make their own way back across Libya. The main targets of the Shoah in Libya were the Jews of Cyrenaica, who were sent to Jado, where nearly one fourth died, but others also suffered. Libyan Jews who were deported to Tunisia were sometimes taken by the Germans for forced labor and 30, including 13 from my father's family, were killed on the same day when a camp near Tunis was bombed, probably by mistake. Some Tripolitanian men were sent to forced labor in the desert, 
Libyan Jews with British passport were sent to camps in Europe, where most fortunately survived. The Jews of Libya had just resumed their lives when there was a savage pogrom in November 1945 in Tripoli and other cities, and another in 1948, which irrevocably destroyed any remaining trust. Most Jews of Libya made Aliyah between 1949 and 1951. Jewish life in Libya, which had existed for at least a thousand years, came to complete end following anti-Jewish riots in 1967. Thank you. Danielle Willard Kyle uh, will now speak to us on the subject of Libyan Jews in the post-war DP camps in Italy. And I personally know almost nothing about this situation, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Thank you, Judith, and thank you to David and Tom. Yes. Yeah. All right, then I'll start us off. Um, so my talk today is entitled, Not Within the Mandate, Libyan Jewish Refugees in Italian Displaced Persons Camps. Cloaked under a veil of secrecy, ignored by the international press, a strange, mysterious migration is taking place from one to another shore of the Mediterranean. This flow is continuing unrelentingly. Small parties manage to cross the comparatively narrow but often quite rough stretches of waters in sailing boats and small motor launches. Larger groups use fishing trawlers, tugs, and other crafts. This new brand of displaced persons are Jews who are trying to escape the Anglo-Arab regime, which for the last six years have prevailed in Libya. Since the end of World War II in 1945, oops, oh, I apologize for that. <clears throat> Jews from Eastern and Central Europe had viewed Italy as the byway to Israel. And although blockades and quotas had significantly prolonged their tenure in Italian displaced persons or DP camps, that is, camps set up by the Allied forces and the United Nations in Germany, Austria, and Italy. And here you have a map of uh, the majority of DP camps um, across Italy. Um, and here are some images uh, from some of the more notable camps, um, some of the bigger ones um, that you can see here. Um, these camps were set up to handle the refugee crisis that was caused by the war. But by 1949, many of these Eastern and Central European Jews had made their way to Israel. Jewish refugees from North Africa, however, were now hoping to follow the same trajectory. <clears throat> this lecture will focus on these North African Jewish migrants, uh, and in particular those from Libya, who made their way to Italy in the late 1940s. <clears throat> so as Vivian has very uh, eloquently put for us, uh, kind of the early history, I'm moving us forward in time. So following its liberation in 1943, Libya was placed under the authority of the British military administration pending a vote on its trusteeship or independence that would occur between 1947 and 1949, ultimately ending in independence in 1951. But between 1948 and 1951, nearly 3,000 of the 36,000 Jews in Libya fled the country. Obtaining legal exit permits from Libya during this time in late 1948 for Jews wishing to emigrate was nearly impossible, despite the long line of applicants. A small minority of somewhere around three to 5,000, uh, so around 10%, traveled through the Italian DP camps to reach Israel. These were individuals, families, and small groups, often of children and youths, uh, who paid smugglers or relied on the di direct intervention of groups like the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee uh, or the JDC or the Joint uh, to help them with this, quote, mysterious migration that we heard of out of Libya. The organization that was in charge of the DP camps at this time was the International Refugee Organization or the IRO. This organization officially labeled European Jews as refugees and displaced persons or DPs, thus making them eligible for asylum benefits. North African Jews, in contrast, were nearly all denied refugee and DP status. Like European Jews, these North African adults and children were uncertain as to how long they would be staying in Italy, but unlike European Jews, they did not have a stable position in the DP camps. 
Their lack of official status caused instability that meant Libyan refugees and aid workers had to struggle to achieve the most basic physical trappings of care, including food and shelter. So this lecture explores the process of registration and decision making around personal classification uh, for these Libyans who are attempting to gain some kind of status in the DP camps. A GDC or a joint report from 1948 stated that, quote, toward the end of September 48, a new element appeared in the Italian DP camps in that Jewish refugees from Tripoli were arriving on the shores of Italy in increasing numbers. Um, Tripoli was often a shorthand for anywhere in Libya, uh, just at that time. So they could have been coming from Benghazi or across Libya. But they were attempting to get to Israel, but were now stuck in Italy. By the end of 1948, the IRO knew that they had to make some kind of formal policy regarding their responsibility for Jews going to Europe from North Africa. If North African Jewish migrants had arrived in Italy before 1948, perhaps things would have turned out differently for them. Perhaps they would have been able to fight for their eligibility. Perhaps the IRO would have granted them status based solely on their experiences during the war, rather than largely ignoring their racial persecution. But the majority of Libyan and North African Jews arrived after the founding of the State of Israel, which was to become key to their problems in Italy. Following the state's creation, the IRO proclaimed its strong desire to not get involved in what it termed, quote, the Arab problem. The number of North African Jewish migrants in Italy was small enough that they could largely be overlooked in international policy, although crucial enough, evidently, that they could not be given status without fear of it impacting the IRO's credibility in the rest of the world. Embedded in the questions surrounding their eligibility for IRO aid were the thorny issues of the migrant's citizenship and their reasons for departure. So the first question to be determined was whether or not these Jewish migrants in Italy were, quote, outside their country of citizenship or habitual residence. So if they were within their country of citizenship, then they could petition for help from their own government and would be of no concern to the IRO. That is, if the IRO could prove that these Libyans were actually Italians living in Italy now, they would have nothing to do with them. Libyan Jews, however, were more varied in their citizenship. So following their occupation, the occupation of Libya by Italy in 1911, Italian authorities implemented a, serious, a series of different statuses for the native Libyan population. Muslim Libyans were deemed, quote, foreign subjects, whereas Jewish Libyans were simply subjects who, until 1938, could acquire Italian citizenship. <clears throat> the implementation of the racial laws in 1938 in both Libya and Italy stripped Italian citizenship from any Jews who had acquired it. The subsequent fall of the fascist regime left many Jews from Libya confused about their citizenship in the post-war period. Some claimed Turkish or Ottoman citizenship, hearkening back to their citizenship prior to Italian colonization, while others claimed Libyan citizenship, while still others claimed their former Italian citizenship. And here you can see two different forms uh, from two different candidates applying for status, one listing Italian as their country of citizenship and one listing Libya. Because Libya remained under British occupation until its acquisition of nationhood in 1951, there was no one to officially redesignate citizenship for those who had lost theirs. Some Libyans chose a different route. Some simply lied to the IRO about their citizenship, hoping to expedite their cases and receive eligibility for resettlement aid, as their intent was simply to leave the country as soon as possible. Take, for instance, the case of Joseph Tajar. He was born in Tripoli to Jewish parents. His parents, who were still living in Tripoli, sent him to Italy because of racial persecution and because they wanted to send him to Israel, they said. He arrived in a fishing boat with a small group of others in September 1948, just after his 13th birthday. But when the boat arrived in Naples, his group leader confiscated all of his identification documents and told him to tell the IRO he was from Bulgaria, not from Tripoli. When interviewed nine days later by the IRO, Tajar told them he was Joseph Tiar from Sofia, Bulgaria, and that he was simply trying to reconnect with his parents and siblings who were already in Israel. Originally believed, he is classified as eligible for resettlement and placed on the list for Israel with the Consulate of Rome. Uh, and you can see his documents here. Um, you can see there's a stamp for eligible on this right-hand one um, that gets replaced because something goes wrong with this plan. The IRO discovers he's actually from Libya. 
we can see this on his second form that's filled out several months later. Uh, he is taken off this list and he's marked as ineligible. And he, from here, he's transferred to a children's center in Salerno in Western Italy, uh, where he would wait until at least April 1949 before making Malia. So this lack of clarity over current citizenship, <clears throat> coupled with the propensity of Libyan Jews who arrived to sometimes lose any paperwork they might have had when they arrived in Italy, became increasingly frustrating for the IRO. Uh, Libyan's formal colonial status also pro proved a problem that was much bigger than the small Libyan Jewish population. The IRO feared that they would be setting a dangerous precedent around decolonization. They worried that if they began to help individuals repatriating from former colonies to metropoles, they would be responsible for far greater numbers than they could handle. Ultimately, most Libyans were deemed not Italian, but not given any other kind of citizenship or help. But North African migrants needed to meet more than just the criteria of citizenship in order to gain status as refugees or DPs eligible for IRO assistance. The IRO explained that it was primarily a question of motivation. Quote, the validity of their objections to returning to their countries of origin, the usual reasons given for unwillingness to return to North Africa and other Arab countries are that there have been anti-Semitic developments in the various countries concerned since the war. And that is not unreasonable for people who have once been attacked to try and escape rather than risk further outbreaks. The question it seems was whether these individuals were truly refugees, that is persons fleeing persecution or simply economic migrants moving because it was financially beneficial to them. The IRO seemed initially to be thinking Libyan Jews might fall into the first category. Yet the answer was not as straightforward as that according to both the IRO and the British. Much of the rationale for leaving revolved around the pogroms that occurred in Libya in November 1945 and in June 1948. The crucial issue was whether there was enough violence or threat of violence in the region to warrant the impending exodus. So the pogrom that Vivian also referenced um, occurred, the first pogrom occurred between November 4th and 6th, 1945, uh, and was among the most violent riots against Jews in modern North African history. <clears throat> Arab Libyans looted and attacked the Jewish quarter of Tripoli that was then under British control. This pogrom claimed the lives of 130 Libyan Jews, uh, but the assurances of the British military government or the BMA in control of Libya at the time and the arrests of some of the instigators convinced many to remain in the country. Although things quieted down following this and relations between Jews and Muslims in the region remained tense but largely peaceable, the pogrom took an economic toll on the Jewish communi community. Here, the tax records of the Jewish community of Tripolitania can be instructive. So in 1943, uh, 2,700 individuals paid taxes, whereas in 1947, only 600 were able to pay. This dramatic drop, which was not at that time correlated to an increase in emigration, indicated that the majority of the community was relying on outside assistance, even two years after the 1945 pogroms. A second anti-Jewish riot occurred in June 1948. This time, however, the majority of Libyan Jews determined to leave the country. Economic precarity and rising racial tensions created a perfect storm for the community. A local reporter describing the aftermath of the 48 pogrom proclaimed, quote, the slogan of every Jew without exception is now, quote, to go away. Irrespective of destination, this is the only joel of every Jew here. They expect in advance to suffer hunger, to abandon their property and their friends, their native country, in order to not become a victim, not to be suddenly slaughtered or burned alive. Yet until February 2nd, 1949, Jews were not able to freely leave Libya because the British refused to ex issue exit permits. Thus, with the sense of so little prospect for improvement, many clandestinely fled to Italy. The IRO struggled to determine Libyan Jews' primary motivation. That is, were they refugees or simply economic migrants? The American Jewish lobby, however, was convinced that the Libyan Jews met the criteria of refugee as one with a reasonable fear of persecution. <clears throat> the JDC wrote, for instance, quote, it is also beyond doubt that the Tripolitanian Jews who have escaped should be given immediate assistance and the possibility of emigrating to other countries. Indeed, the fate of Tripolitanian Jews who succeeded in reaching Italy 
must be considered within the same framework of assistance extended by the IRO to other DPs from whom they only differ by the mere facts that they have become displaced only at a later stage, but by exactly the same causes rooted in war events. In other words, they were DPs just like the others. Their report made it clear that life was remained critically dangerous for Jews in Libya, thus giving them good motivation to migrate elsewhere and to be eligible for receiving aid in doing so. However, the British Foreign Office wrote reports contradicting those of the JDC. Their reports claimed, quote, that the situation is under good control and that there is no reason for Jews to leave the country as far as internal conditions are concerned. The British remained unconvinced of the Libyan Jews' fear for their safety. The BMA argued, had made careful investigations, but could obtain no information that life for Jews in Arab countries was intolerable or that they had any serious grounds for complaint about their personal security, end quote. It was clear from the BMA's perspective that the Libyans were simply taking advantage of the situation. They claimed, quote, the movement of Jewish persons from North Africa was not motivated by oppression or by fear for their personal safety. The Jewish emigration was economically motivated, the BMA believed. By 1940, May 1949, any hopes of Libyan Jews receiving assistance and eligibility from the IRO were firmly and solidly dashed. All application for assistance, care and maintenance forms were restamped, not within the mandate of the IRO. The IRO's official policy was now to take no responsibility whatsoever, end quote, regarding assistance for North African Jews. They argued that, quote, Jewish minorities in North Africa are probably technically within the mandate. Their policy cable even stated that these cases represented refugee problems, not envisaged by governments as within the scope of IRO operations. But so too were Arab refugees now fleeing persecution in Israel. Conferring eligibility on one of these groups, the IRO believed, would require giving eligibility to both, a move they were not prepared to make. The IRO felt they could not be responsible for adding cases which would increase their workload and perhaps more importantly, would potentially upset the delicate balance between the powers involved. They recognized the British would certainly oppose any policy aimed at assisting Jews to travel from North Africa to Israel. Ultimately, they argued that these problems are beyond their present scope of operations because of budgetary limitations. It seems, in the end, that the IRO agreed with the assessment made by the Libyan Jews, the Italians, and the JDC, that these individuals met the definition of refugees. Nevertheless, despite acknowledging that they met the criteria, the IRO extended little practical help to Libyan Jews, explicitly noting that doing so could invite political pressure to help non-Jewish Arabs as well. But what of the Libyans who are already in Italy? <clears throat> the IRO ultimately decided to grant all North African Jews in Italy an informal exception. Thus, their papers would be stamped ineligible, as we saw earlier, for status and aid, but they would continue to be granted housing and some food aid by the JDC until they were able to get to Israel. The housing and the food were often substandard, although not always worse than what Eastern European Jews received in the camps. The atmosphere in the Libyan camps, however, was, quote, one of extreme tenseness, they said as refugees felt uprooted and increasingly more insecure about their futures. Throughout these movements, the IRO continually denied these Libyan Jewish immigrants official status, which meant continually extended stays in Italy with little to no say over their own whereabouts or futures. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Can I, um, can I ask a couple of questions very, very quickly. Um, for, first of all, where, where are the, um, the archives of, of the documents that you were, you were showing us? Yes, um, several of those documents are from the JDC archives, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, uh, which had offices both in Tripoli and throughout Italy during yeah. that time. Um, they're presently in New York or Israel. Um, and uh, some of them are also from the, the Wiener Library, in yeah. London, um, and uh, a couple of them are from the the IRO papers uh, in the Archive National of Paris. What what was the relationship between sort of Libyan Jews and Italian Jews, who presumably had their own 
set of problems post-war? I mean, or, or, or was there? Was it just two, two separate things? It was two separate things. Um, there was a fairly congenial relationship. Uh, at this going on at the same time is is the question over the trusteeship of Libya, uh, and so who is going to take control between Italy, uh, the U.S., Soviet Union, uh, and the British, or whether Libya will become independent. Um, and this speaks uh, so. The Italian Jews wanted Italy to take control, and so they actually wanted Libyan Jews to stay in Libya to be supporters of the Italians. Can I ask a more general question? Because our, our, our core audience, I'm, I'm not sure this is really to, to, to all three of you. Um, our, our core audience is, is mostly interested in the uh, Spanish and Portuguese diaspora. I'm assuming that most of the Jews in Libya were um, sort of indigenous uh, Arab speakers. And yet, of course, there was a uh, community, the Grana, in uh, Tunis related to, to Livorno, and of course, a lot of uh, uh, Iberian Sephardim in, in Egypt. Were, were, were there any um, in Libya as well, or just one or two? Yeah, there were a few who came from uh, Spain. How long ago, it varies, you know. Um, in fact, my cousin, Labi, is a direct descendant. Um, uh, I was actually the the um, the Spanish uh, when applying for a Sephardic citizenship. I actually got a letter saying that my family name was actually expelled or forced to convert in 1492. So uh, you know there were some um, from uh, the Spanish background. You know, there was the, you could tell from last names as well, like Franco, but not always. Yes. Um, so, yeah, there were, uh, but they were there since the first or second temple period. Yeah, 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 of course, yes, yeah. And um, where, where, where is sort of the, the main sort of Libyan Jewish diaspora today? Is that in America and Israel or? They're Israel? primarily in Israel with a large community in Rome. In fact, you'll hear, um, uh, uh, Jacob in the next uh, uh, thing. And Danielle, I, I, I really like that you said that Tripoli, when they say Tripoli, it could very well be from Benghazi also. When I did the oral histories and I met people, they say, ah, a Tripolitai, you're Tripolitanian. I say, I used to say, no, I'm from Benghazi. They got all confused and said, Avaluv, no? It's Libya though. Yeah. Yes, it's Libya. Yeah. Okay, so Tripoli Thai. No, Benghazi. <laughs> we are totally unrecognized as another city there. Mm. Yes, absolutely. I have a question as well. I don't know for whom. Um, what happened to uh, Libyan Jewish archives after the, uh, the community left Libya? A very good question. Danielle, do you, do you want me to answer that? Oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So, um, some, unfortunately a lot was destroyed. Some was, has been taken out. I really don't know the details, maybe Danielle knows. And like the Iraqi archives, now there's question whether or not to return it. And um, I don't know if you want my own opinion, but First of all, the Jewish community was the only one that created the Jewish artifacts there. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody helped. <laughs> not a penny. Not building it. Not making it. Secondly, return it to what? To destroy? Uh, I mean, we see what they do with archives in general in certain parts of the world there. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there is this controversy. In fact, I'll put in a little plug for the um, a new documentary that's coming out. Um, it, it's out already. Um, and it talks a little bit about the Iraqi archives, what people are going through to try to keep them from going back to Iraq. And I suspect next is the Libyan archives. Mm -hmm. okay. And Jimena is working on it also. Yeah. There's a question in chat for Daniela. Did you publish papers or 
the thesis about Libyan Jews or refugees? So I just I just completed my 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 doctoral thesis, uh, which is uh, broader than Libyan Jewish refugees, but it looks at the Italian displaced person camp experience of both North African Jewish DPs and Eastern European. Um, so there's book manuscripts in progress. Uh, there will be a book. Um, excuse me, I just saw that uh, Avram Arbib, um, who's done a lot of research in this, and uh, I interviewed his father, actually. He says at least one-fifth of Libyan Jews came from Spain. I didn't know that number. Do we know, um, maybe Avra Avraham can, can, can type, do we know if they, they went there um, before 1492, in 1492 or perhaps later from you know other other ottoman um territories um of, obviously the sephardic story is one of everybody moving everywhere um with some some rapidity i i, I can see um Ju judy judy sorry just to change the subject Ju judy is saying that that gaddafi had jewish cousins is that true <laughs> you know, my response to that it may be true but who wants him <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you hear both ways, yeah. um, but but you know, from Spain they went all over. I mean, Abraham might have some other opinions, but or or facts, but from uh, Spain they went all over the uh, Bal the Balkans, yeah. and they were dispersed in many places. There's always the story of the shipwreck. Uh, apparently, my four uh, ancestors of mine, brothers, were on their way to uh, Israel, and uh, of course, the ship broke down, and and they fell in. Two of them fell in love and stayed, and the other two proceeded. So, you know. Mm -hmm. do, do do you know what the the, the minhagim were in in? Um... So Benghazi and, and Tripoli. I mean, is it, is it like sort of Jerba or, or, or its own Minhag or like Spanish and Portuguese or, 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 or what? They had their own uh, Minhag, but very, very similar. Uh, the, the cantillation is different. It's a little closer to Tunisian than Moroccan. The food, of course, is closer to Tunisian than Moroccan because Libyan Jews would never mix sweet with uh, in their casseroles, you know. So, um, uh, but 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 you know, um, Daniel Elazar Zifron uh, Olivraha wrote a great book called The Other Jews, and uh, uh, he mentioned uh, he he said that the similarity between. Um, uh, all the way from Iraq, all the whole Mediterranean, and through the Silk um, Road, were 95% uh, similarity or something like that with liturgy, and uh, especially because of the trade, the Silk Route, the, show, the questions and answers were kept being sent back and forth. Yes. So there was a lot of similarity, yeah. Okay. I re-edited my documentary, The Last Jews of Libya, in recognition of the 50th anniversary, um, the 50th anniversary um, uh, uh, of the end of, the, of Jewish life in Libya. And at the end, I added portions of an interview with Jacob Sassoon, who lived in Tripoli until 1967 and now lives in Rome, the second largest community of Jews from Libya after Israel, as we said. Jacob discusses the last days in Tripoli when he was forced to flee and the transition to Jewish life in Rome. The interview is in Italian with English subtitles. Quando nacque diciamo la comunità ebraica si concentrò in in una zona chiamata Ara e quindi questa area c'era una zona era piccola e l'altra la, eh, quella più grande. Nel 1945, ad esempio, successe un pogrom e questo è il che provocò un pochino che alcuni di, de, degli ebrei che abitavano nel, in questi quartieri sono andati un po' fuori. 
noi eh, abitavamo in una palazzina vi, eh, non lontano da questo quartiere, comunque c'erano lì de, dei personaggi che non erano ebrei, che lavoravano lì sotto, dai, che erano in, eh, ci hanno protetto, per, ci hanno impedito che questi arabi eh, musulmani che andavano lì, ci hanno, eh, li han, li ha, hanno evitato che loro attaccassero la nostra famiglia. Però una mia zia è stata trucidata, sia lei, in questo io parlo del 45, sia lei che, che i due figli. Nel 1948 ci fu un secondo pogrom, però in questo caso qui la comunità ebraica era molto più organizzata, si aspettava questa circostanza e quindi rispose agli attacchi dei, dei, dei musulmani contro gli ebrei. E I morti ci furono lo stesso, ma in quantità minore. Quando nacqui io, già mio padre era, un po era uscito fuori dall'Ara. Ma ci andavamo sempre per, per il tempio, per la scuola. Le prime scuole ebraiche che erano dentro le sinagoghe. Una volta che il protettorato libico, eh, gli inglesi, gli dettero l'indipendenza, il, il governo cedette alla necessità di chiudere le scuole ebraiche o scuole che insegnavano ebraico. Quindi mh, necessariamente tutti quelli che hanno frequentato le scuole ebraiche hanno dovuto adattarsi e andare a scuole italiane. Giornalmente si andava al tempio tre volte al giorno, la mattina, il pomeriggio e la sera. E mentre e quasi tutti aveva, facevamo questo l'uso di andare nel tempio, quasi tutti. Invece quelli che abitavano un po' fuori eh, ci andavano almeno una volta alla mattina e poi eh, sicuramente il sabato e nelle feste. Durante il, fe il sabato venivamo, ci riunivamo tutti in famiglia e, il, e, e questo succedeva anche in tutte le feste degli sposati. Vivevamo diciamo, in, in vita molto, molto, molto eh, comune. E non avevamo la possibilità di fare cose diverse. Si usava andare al cinema di tanto in tanto, eh, le passeggiate lì al corso che erano consentite più, che, più ai maschi che non alle femmine perché le femmine eh, praticamente se, se erano accompagnate da noi maschi più o meno li proteggevamo altrimenti era un po' pericoloso. Allora, lo Shabbat significa che noi dobbiamo eh, riservarlo praticamente un, al riposo totale, quindi noi usiamo andare al Tempio, dopodiché si ritorna a casa, e si sta a casa, si, si legge la Bibbia o si conversa con i parenti di problemi religiosi, Dopodiché, eh, fino, fi, e questo parte dal venerdì prima del tramonto al sabato dopo il tramonto, ed era un riposo totale, quindi non, non, e ciò avveniva anche durante tutte le festività, non si usava andare in, in automobile, non si usava accendere la luce, eh, si mangiava il cucinato dal giorno precedente. I rapporti tra la comunità italiana e ebraica erano ottimi. Quello che non erano buoni erano con la comunità araba, ma di una certa parte di comunità araba. Gli arabi che erano della vecchia generazione andavano molto bene d'accordo con noi, ma quelli della nuova generazione erano molto politicizzati verso il nasserismo che era influente in Libia. Eh, nel 67, quando c'è stata la guerra dei sei giorni, eh, io mi trovavo lì e a un certo punto sono andato in un campo di rifugiati perché una parte del governo ha, ha voluto proteggere noi di religione ebraica in questo campo e lì siamo stati una quarantina di giorni 
finché loro non ci hanno dato i documenti e non ci hanno consentito il passaporto libico, ma un semplice lascia passare. Ci hanno consentito di portarci via solamente una valigia di roba, e abbigliamento solo, niente gioielli, niente di ricordi o argenteria o oggetti di valore. Quando siamo saliti sull'aereo era una vera liberazione, però subentrò l'angoscia di quello che ci aspettava all'arrivo. Quando siamo scesi dalla scala dell'aereo e fu un abbraccio lunghissimo quando ci siamo incontrati con la, per, la persona della nostra comunità che ci accoglieva lì. Un abbraccio lunghissimo, emozionante e, e, e anche con delle lacrime perché significava la libertà. Siamo stati aiutati dalla comunità ebraica di Roma, dal governo italiano, dalla Joint Committee americano che ha aiutato i rifugiati. In, a Tripoli negli ultimi anni io ero a capo di un'azienda che aveva 120 operai, non pochi, e quando sono venuto in Italia ho dovuto affrontare la vita facendo vendendo enciclopedie per poter andare avanti. All'inizio eh, loro non, avevano, eh, non erano religiosi quanto noi e quindi noi abbiamo dovuto faticare un pochino per in... non ci sono più problemi. Ma comunque ormai siamo integrati totalmente nella comunità. Quando siamo venuti dalla Libia siamo venuti quasi tutti in piazza Bologna. Dunque questo tempio qua è un, il tempio nostro Tripolino perché noi in primo momento abbiamo cercato di andare anche se molto lontano al tempio romano ma il rito di là è un rito italiano che è sempre sefardita ma eh, differente dal nostro. Allora per poter usare il nostro rito siamo, eh, abbiamo voluto creare un nostro tempio. Questo eh, luogo per noi rappresenta molto perché è stato il, il primo ristorante tavola calda con piatti tipici tripolini. Eh, il proprietario eh, è di Bengasi. Ho avuto la possibilità di trasmettere ai miei figli le tradizioni, eh, le tradizioni non solo culinarie, ma anche le tradizioni ebraiche di uso, di essere sempre uniti, di aiutarsi in famiglia, di fare tutto ciò che, era, che, era, che noi facevamo giù eh, in Libia eh, con i nostri genitori, quindi porte aperte a casa e inviti in regolari, avere buona vicinanza con tutti, e in, diciamo i nuovi eh, concittadini, ma cercare di mantenere la comunanza con i, i cittadini che noi avevamo eh, in Libia. So, um, at the beginning, the Italian, and to answer your question, David, at the beginning, the Italian community understandably thought, who are these people? But eventually, I think they even helped them, and they have a very good uh, Uh, relationship and in fact it, it kind of um, um, mm -hmm. rejuvenated the, the Jewishness of the Italian Jews who were becoming quite assimilated. They had uh, I think only one kosher butcher with the Libyan Jews they had many more many more restaurants so they actually you know and more opportunity to um, marry uh, within Judaism you know. Can, can I ask what, what language people spoke at home? Was it sort of Arabic or Italian or was it French? I mean, was the yes. Arabic running schools there? Yes. I, feel, I personally feel like I was born in three countries, actually, because uh, you didn't ask, you asked about language, but I'll tell you about the culture. I lived in a Sephardic Jewish home with all the rules. I went to a Catholic nun school And I lived in a Muslim country and there was Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And I understood what those three were. And a lot of people, we spoke Arabic and Italian and the kids who went, the boys and even the girls at the beginning when they, there were Jewish schools for them, 
they added the Hebrew sometimes, but my father always wanted to maintain traditionalism. So he preferred Arabic. My mother was more progressive, so she wanted Italian. So a lot of families were like that. And yeah. some, the Franco spoke Ladino, the family Franco, which uh, who was there, yeah. Okay. So both Arabic and Italian, yeah. Um, it's a question from Marcus, I think for, for, for Danielle. Um, what's the attitude of the authorities in Israel, the Jewish agency and so forth, to Libyan Jews in um, DPs, um, those attempting to get to Israel? Was, was their attitude in any way different um, towards that shown towards European Jews in the same camps? By and large, the attitudes of the Israeli organizations were fairly similar. Um, they both were fairly welcoming of the Jews who were in the DP camps in Italy. Uh, of those trying to get out of Libya, there was some more question, um, particularly around issues of illness. Um, but the Jewish agency was a big, uh, a big player in the DP camps for Eastern Europeans and Libyans. Um, so by the time the Libyans are there, most of the Eastern Europeans uh, have left. Um, and with them kind of went a lot of the the, the financial support for things like cultural organizations within the camps. Um, so in that way, they're a little bit different, um, but they are fighting for the right to, to remain there and the right to emigrate uh, on behalf of both populations. Okay. Um, so, so Sarah writes that um, there's archival material from Libya and the central archives of the Jewish people in uh, Jerusalem um, what, what, what happened to the Italian civil archives for Libya? Were they left there or did they have time to evacuate them to, to Italy? Does anybody... I, I believe they're in Rome okay. uh, under, under their military archives, but I could, be, I could be mistaken about that, but I believe they're, they're in Rome separate from the central archives, so the central state archives, and then there's the military archives, and I believe their colonial archives are there. Um, I don't know how much when I did some research there, there wasn't as much on the Jewish case, on the Jewish uh, ish question uh, in that archive. Um, you asked about archives earlier and I wanted to add one more that most of these documents came from, uh, some of them came also from the Arelson archives, uh, which is formerly known as the International Tracing Service, um, which might be, you might be familiar with, but would certainly be of interest uh, to some of your genealogy. Um, yes, sorry. sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I just wanted to say that the Italians took their colonial archives with them to Rome. They incorporated them into the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And um, currently um, they're in Rome, except there are copies in Princeton University Library of many documents. Okay. Um, sorry, this is a real genealogy question, but um, were, were, were there any census um, in, in Libya under Italian uh, or indeed even under Ottoman rule that anybody knows? Yeah, there was. Yeah, th there was. I don't know the details, but I've actually seen lists of names and, uh, and uh, yes, so there were. Okay. Yes. I wonder if I've run those down. <laughs> is there any nostalgia for uh, Libya? Any longing to go back among Libyan Jews nowadays? Once upon a time, no. In general, mm -hmm. the answer is no. There have been okay. many who wanted to go back and some have gone back. Um, uh, but... Um, uh, yeah. It's almost impossible, of course. Excuse me, one second. What, what did you think? Well, those who went oh. back were often arrested as Zionist spies. Mm -hmm. They were certainly not welcome. No. Yeah. And, and, and once when my mother was uh, listening to my brothers uh, uh, being nostalgic about Libya and I joined in, Later, when we, she and I were together, she said, what do you miss about Libya exactly? That you can't go out in the streets by yourself. You can't speak to a male 
uh, you can't, you know, and she named all these restrictions and, uh, mm -hmm. but, but there was time. I tried to go back, especially when I was filming and uh, first, of course, you couldn't go back as a Jew, but then that was okay. Then you couldn't go back because there was an American uh, embargo. So then I couldn't go back as an American. And then when I finally spoke to Libya House here in New York, they said, uh, you can, there's no problem. You can go back as a Jew. You can go back as an American. Um, uh, then I said, I was born in Benghazi. And they said, let me take your name and number and we'll contact the, the government there. It was Gaddafi at the time and we'll get back to you. And I remember asking if I don't hear from you in a month, should I call you? Should I get back in touch with you? And they said, no, 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 no. It's gonna take a lot longer than that. So, um, so, and after that, you know, it just, and like Judy said, I mean, we, we I have some friends who went back and uh, it, it was uh, taking life in their own hands sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, remember what they said also that the older generation was more respectful. It's the younger generation who were, which were politicized and Nasserized that uh, mm. really broke the tie in the yeah. tie. Um, I've um, unmuted um, Avraham Abib in case he, he, he wants to add anything. Um, I, 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 did, I didn't get the question that, that you asked me before, so I didn't, so I couldn't answer, but uh, uh, you answered some question. But anyway, uh, about nostalgia, I think you, one should be crazy to, to want to go back there, especially now when they, they there is no country. There are two different countries in a civil war, mm -hmm. and uh, anyway, the, the places are not the same. The people are not the same. The, there is not even one Jew there. So, by the way, even Italians, uh, Italians that uh, want to visit uh, Ital Libyan Ital Italians from Libya that want to visit uh, Libya are not allowed. Uh, only, only. Italians that were not lived, were not born in Libya are allowed. Yeah. So, so that's, uh, I have a friend that uh, took a cruise and she was not allowed to, 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 to leave the ship. Uh, yeah. And anyway, that, uh, th there is no reason to have nostalgia. I mean, uh, we were lucky they, they, we were forced to leave. Yeah, the, the, the story of people leaving before um, sounds exactly like the story that the president of my uh, synagogue, uh, Saba Zubaydah, described when he, he, his family had to flee from Baghdad and, you know, they were just allowed to take a single suitcase and uh, given a, a one-way uh, laissez-passer. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Esther's asking if there's a list of Jews who were killed in the pogroms of 1945 and 1948. Of course there is. There is. Yeah, of course there is. Is is that any any online anywhere or? I, I I don't know. Maybe maybe my um, brother that was listening knows, but maybe Vivian yeah. knows. But uh, the I know the 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 museum for for Libyan Jews in Oriuda they they have it. Yeah, y y Yitzhak has just said they have a list on the wall. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> the documents in London. Sorry. There's a document in London that also has the list, but it's not online. There's an English translation in London and then there's one in Paris. 